if I could go all in Coco Chanel and move into a hotel for the rest of my life, it would be at Ham. And yes, that is shameless hinting. One of the reasons for that is, this is, is the designer Ilse Crawford. She's the founder of Studio Ilse and of the Department of Man and Well-Being at the Design Academy Eindhoven. She says that good design can nudge us to better behavior. And after being in some of the spaces that she has designed, I can only agree. Please welcome Ilse Crawford. everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak with you. Are you all architects or what's the balance? Just so I know who I'm talking to. Mostly all, all pretty much. Okay, good. <laughs> so nice to have not need to have. One morning, a few years ago, I went into a meeting on a project, and it was one of those horrible meetings, I'm sure you've had them all once in a while, value engineering. Um, I was confronted by a very aggressive project manager who was in the process of cutting my budget to less than 1% of the construction budget. And, you know, there are limits. And I said, look, come on, you know, this is not acceptable. You may as well not bother. And he said, interior design. I mean, it's nice to have, but not need to have, is it? <laughs> and, you know, the trouble is, that is how the system works. I don't know how it works here, but certainly in the UK and in most of the places that I work, um, the end gets cut disproportionately, which is why so many of the insides of our buildings look and feel so dreadful and don't last, and why so often architects are disappointed by the insides of buildings. So, just as a reminder, these are some of our scouting shots, the before shots for potential projects. These are the spaces where we live. Financial institutions, soup kitchens, airports, and restaurants. It should be going. Do I need to click again? It's been tested. Apparently it works. First class lounge Heathrow. Financial institution. At him before. So, all equally dreadful, 
interior spaces that have been given no attention and probably no budget. Soulless spaces, careless spaces, spaces without value or values. No wonder we feel so alienated. But, you know, while developers, institutions, politicians and clients all recognize architecture as something that brings value, sometimes, um, they rarely give interiors the same recognition. Interior design continues to be seen as a luxury, an add-on, even shopping. And we rarely get the chance to work as a team with architects from the very beginning. So we end up with the relay problem, and priorities get lost along the way. Fundamentally, I think, there's a misunderstanding of what interior design is. There's not enough informed debate about the deeper impact of interiors, how they affect the user, how for commercial clients they often create the business proposition by building a world, um, and how you can basically make better, more long-lasting, more adaptable, more sustainable buildings that are better for people if only architects and interior designers work together from the beginning. And it is why events like this are so important, to discuss the narrative, to discuss our process. Rethink, reuse, rebuild, for sure, but I think we also need to reframe. I'll introduce four projects um, and a couple of products if I have time, and maybe a surprise. Talk to me later if you want to know more about the particular project. This is one that I think totally underwrites what I've just been saying. It's a former soup kitchen, now community center in Earl's Court. It was a very decent enterprise. It gave lunches to 150 homeless people, vulnerable people every day. But you know, you can see what it's like. It's grab and go. But then this guy came along with his wife, Laura Gilmore, Massimo Batura, and he has an NGO called Food for Soul. And it, in this instance, linked up with Project Felix, a supermarket surplus NGO, us, and sometimes chefs. And the idea was to bring dignity to the table, specifically table service and beauty. And that was our brief. We were given very little money, I had 35,000 for the whole project. But with that brief, you can do something. So we managed to get together people who came behind that brief. Vitra gave us reused chairs from their cafeteria because they constantly change their identity. Um, Artemidi gave us lighting. We got carpets, we got paint, you know. Who doesn't want to get behind that idea? And design can get you out of that corner. It was a simple project in a way, but beauty held it together. Details like plants, tabletop, things you touch, the vitra chairs, meant that that is what happened. It became a frame for people to spend time together to help each other instead of it being this old school, philanthropic, top down, you know, slightly, I have to say, you know, mean, actually. Not intentionally, but not generous. You know, to create that generous circle is powerful. And what was very interesting was that not only did the people who were using the kitchen at lunchtime spend longer together, which meant that they could also do classes, IT, languages, etc. But also, surprisingly, corporates hired it in the evening because they would much prefer to hire that than a hotel hospitality suite. I mean, of course. But I talked to one of the guys and um, asked him what he felt about it, you know, was this something that resonated with him? You know, after all, we came in and kind of took over their space. And he said, you know, the thing about this thing, this place, 
is that at least it shows that someone cares. So, one reason why we all do what we do. The studio is in Bermondsey, in London, in an old tannery. We're 15 people. I started off as a journalist. I was a journalist for 10 years, which I think has very much shaped my thinking about how to approach spaces. We are a combination of journalists, architects, interior designers, and product designers. We work with strategists and filmmakers along the way. We design the studio so that it can be open to outsiders. So we have suppers, we have lunches, where anybody who is around joins, because I'm scared of becoming a bubble. Um, it's really interesting to just bring people in from different ages, different parts of the world. This is our process. It's very messy. And I'm sure you're thinking the tough bit is finding clients with the courage to go on that journey. Most people want answers before asking questions and aren't comfortable with uncertainty. But if you don't ask questions, the trouble is you usually sooner or later end up here. <laughs> For us, the why and the what is as important as the how. We combine data, economic, environmental, social, psychological, physiological, when very relevant. But data is not enough. As Plato said, words without conversations are orphans. So my journalistic tools come in handy. We listen a lot. We observe, we see the big picture, we question, we spend a lot of time, what I call designing minds, understanding why people think the way they think. We step back and imagine, and we communicate a lot. We've put a lot of effort into our communication tools. This is also where we integrate architecture, other consultants, to make the total orchestration, where we resolve conflicting briefs and impossible agendas. We learn together. Then is the three o'clock in the morning feeling, um, to quote Alto, where you take all of that, internalize it, and integrate it with yeah, our values as a studio, our humanistic values, to come up with a creative solution. We don't have a style. We're more interested in how we can create this sense of place, this evolving sense of place, and bring those unmeasurable values together with the measurables. In fact, we see that as our task, to protect those going forward. And then, simple things like integrating tiny daily actions, that physicality, bringing people together, the obvious, like making it more healthy in terms of its materiality, and never forgetting that we are part of something much, much bigger. I'll introduce you to a few projects. I won't go into them in depth because Obviously, there's no time for that, but do ask me more if you are interested. This is your local. It was built in 2012. It was actually designed in um, 2008, but it took a long time to get through planning because some of the neighbors were not too happy about it. They're probably more happy now. Um, but yeah, it slowed it down. But it's lasted. And I think one of the reasons it's lasted is we played to the building. It had to have an ongoing story of place. It's such a strong building. It's an arts and crafts building, a building which was, if you like, a shrine to domestic life. And so we translated that to 
the 21st century. It focuses on arts and crafts. I mean, this was what it was like before. It was a student information center. Quite often people say, gosh, it must have been great to find a lovely old building like that. Well, look again. Um, we went back to the plans. We tweaked them a bit, but kept them essentially the same. Um, you know, with tweaks for relevance and operations. And certainly, when you look at the interior, that focus on craft is part of it, because it always was. The couple that built it was a government official, so it was very brown downstairs and sort of, you know, powerful. And then upstairs, his wife, Anna, clearly fancied herself as a bit of a Karen Larson, and it was all light and airy, and she had an amazing collection of Swedish crafts, by all accounts. We found some pictures, actually, of the upstairs rooms. So, the opportunity, really, was there, how to translate that. The challenge was the footprint, it was tiny. But again, you know, that can also be a good thing. It meant that we could have no front or back of house. There simply wasn't room, which meant that we had to think about a different model of service, one that involved far fewer people, total transparency, and trust. And it's worked. I mean, the people that work there are absolutely fantastic. And somehow or other, because of that transparency, they just own the whole thing and have flourished in that context. But the building was designed for that. It wasn't a later addition. There's a sommelier there now, Nicholas Oldman, who's, I believe, got the best wine list in the Nordics. And, you know, they're a tiny team. But that's because they've been given responsibility. You know, it's so far away from the normal sort of luxury model. The furniture is a mix of solid crafted pieces. The sofa was made in Newcastle. Um, it's guaranteed for 25 years. Um, the glasses are Ingrid Rahman. The, tech, the um, ceramics are Birgitta Vats. You know, they're special. I'm actually going to skip this if I can. Great. Um, but I can see you're probably thinking, yeah, great, you know, it's a small hotel, how does that have relevance to a, a bigger project, you know, tons of money, etc. although I must say, no more than its equivalent. Um, we won a pitch for an airline. Cathay Pacific to do their lounges. It was a funny thing. We had done an arts bar in Hong Kong, and someone at Cathay Pacific was, th they had a, a list including people like Norman Foster, and I think almost just for a laugh they put us on there. And much to their surprise, we won. Although even then, we unwon. So they made us do a pilot because they sort of didn't believe it. Um, and in the end, we won that too. So we did 10 lounges that have to last a minimum of 10 years, which doesn't sound much except that it's 2,000 people a day that go through, some of the most highly trafficked. And one of the lounges is 5,000 square meters, so you can probably imagine the scale. We spent a lot of time in lounges. That's what they looked like. They weren't in great shape. And our take was to focus on the frequent traveler to make the individual universal. We focused all the money on the bits that counted, so the walls. You can't paint in the lounges, there's no time to repair them, and they get very badly dented by wheelies and what have you. Um, and we focused on details, you know, healthy materials, sockets, lighting, chair dimensions. We made this sure that the seating was appropriate for using tablets and phones. We sit differently today. We sit diagonally, not front to back. And we looked at the data. We looked at things like food waste and how shocking that was and had conversations with Cathay 
who were reluctant initially to let go of the buffet, um, but then they realized how much food waste there was. And we said, look, you know, we've talked to people. Actually, what they want is a freshly made soup. And they were kind of going, but surely not. I mean, that's, you know, it's not luxurious, it's not lavish, but it is what you want before you fly. And we sort of said, well, look, we'll make it great. Let, give us that chance and we will make it special. It turned out there are 150 people behind the wall making food, so why not bring some of them front of house? And it's been you know, hugely successful and I think is very much now a definition of their brand. We introduced a tea house because after all you don't always want to booze in the air. And a place to sleep, because one of the things they said to us initially was no sofas, we don't want people to sleep, it looks hideous. But, you know, that's not easy for the staff to drag very tired people off sofas. And not kind, you know, I think people are knackered. So we figured out a space at the rear of the lounge, quite a generous space where people can take a nap. This is a space where we had a tiny budget, but nonetheless, you can still make a difference. I mean, if you're starting with this, which is what happens when you are in careless spaces, I'm afraid. Originally, they were in five houses. I don't know if you're familiar with the Anna Freud Center, but it's a family mental health center, and they wanted to bring everything under one roof, bring, um, family therapy, education, masters, a school for kids, teenagers with behavioral issues, all under one roof. So, you know, the five houses had to go. But it was tough. Um, 3,200 3, square meters. Um, it was a great collaboration with the architects, Penor and Prasad, but I think it was quite frustrating for everyone because we arrived rather late on the project. Um, and a lot of stakeholders. You know, it's not so easy working with a lot of highly intelligent, highly sensitive individuals. I mean, a room th full of therapists is not so easy. But we did it, and I think the architects in the end were actually super happy that it was us, not them. Um, and we learned so much from talking to them, and I think just it opened up the thinking and about the opportunities of this space. I mean, our tools were pretty analog, you know. We gave people colored stickers. But it tells you quite a lot, you know, who wanted cubicles and who wanted communal, who, you know, didn't really want too much of that professional atmosphere, but really wanted it domestic. I mean, there were, funnily enough, precisely because of the naivety of the tools, I think it opened up the discussion where we could move away from center of excellence, let's have a fancy foyer, to something that felt warm and safe. Because also one of the problem is when there isn't time to listen, is that the loudest voice in the room or the first idea wins. And it's not always the best idea. You know, these are families and they're having a rough ride. They wanted a safe place that would still be there in 10 years time, somewhere that they could see as being part of their world. Um, and we were able to bring in some, not so many, but some really good solid pieces. Um, the same sofa from Etham but also some surprises like Noguchi lights, which you might think would be veto, but actually the kids love them because they're fragile and they relate to that. We work with just businesses like Zanat, who provided that hand-carved table, um, and also, of course, address some of the really critical sustainability issues which you can in a new building. So, Lighting, of course, was energy efficient. The carpet tiles were deso. Um, the textiles were quadrat. You know, we really made sure that we addressed all of that. Although, as you well know, project management can also be a challenge there. 
But what was so important was to integrate both technical and human values. This is the staff floor. This is their offices because, you know, you need a break as well. And this is the teenager school, so it had to be a bit more robust. So yeah, if you look at the sort of list, the classic list of the things that one hopes to integrate into a new building and a new interior, I think we did pretty well. Um, we could always do better, but I think that integration of us with the architects was fantastic. And you know, we're both really happy to have had the chance to work together. We also work on products. I mean, it's easier, of course, when it's a singular object and you don't have so many people involved. That's always challenging on a business. Um, we work with the local lighting company, Vassberg. It's our second collaboration. And have been able with them to make a light that's high in energy efficiency, but also has the possibility to replace the LED because technology changes in front of your eyes. Um, and it's beautiful. And I think that is where design and sustainability and collaboration can come together to make things better, measurably and unmeasurably better. It's in aluminium and polished copper, as well as the white. But of course, the technical things are not the only important things here. Um, you know, the humanity of the system is also really important. For proper sustainability, you have to look beyond the things we know. And we worked with a textile company based in Barcelona on a range that was made in India, Nepal, and um, Pakistan. And that was pretty interesting because, you know, it's not visible, but we know that working conditions are not what they could be. Nanny's great. I mean, she has extremely high standards, which is why we worked with her. We knew we could achieve what we tried to achieve. And we did a range of a hammock, a, several rugs, cushions, etc. But first of all, we asked the producers what would make the most difference to them. And they said, local fiber, hand spun, because obviously that's work, no bleach and no dye for the environment, but also for them, because they get horrific um, skin diseases, dermatitis, and so on, because of the chemicals that they usually have to work with. And so that meant we had to work backwards. We got samples from them, and we figured out what we could do within those very tight constraints. But I think we found something beautiful as a result. And I think this is one way that we have to work going forward. We have to go right back to the source and understand what will make things better for them, instead of telling them what to do. Hang on, I'm going to skip over that. Ultimately, it is in those details that you can make something special, and in that relationship, I think, how that works. It's so different to the, you know, this is the design, do it mindset. It really is a relationship. And then you get surprises. All of these principles have been embedded in a course I've been running at the Design Academy Eindhoven for 20 years. I've actually just stopped because, first of all, I think that 18-year-olds are pretty much on the right track, and they certainly don't need me. I think that um, clients and Potentially, architecture could be an interesting place to come together with some of the things that I've been discussing. So that's the plan. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've had 600 students through the department. And the idea really is to think about the whole system, to put yourself in the middle instead of at the end. 
you know, we have to integrate the human, the humane, the health, the community, and nature. And I think design is in an interesting place in that system. It can't solve everything, but I think it has to understand where it sits in the chain and act accordingly. Past graduates include Tom van Soest. He has his own company called Stone Cycling. It's maybe six, seven years old. And it's a rather successful one. It's a recycling company, but it's localized in Eindhoven. And it's a business and a very successful one. And they're beautiful. It's very much something that is used by local developers. And I've actually recently used it on a project in Belgium. A recent graduate, Pauline Esperon, she worked with the flax industry in northern France and figured out that they have to send the flax, and this is surprising, I'm sure, to China to be processed. So, of course, the contract changes all the time. It's very hard for them to make a living. So she basically looked at what you could design with unprocessed flax. That's a process, but it's a way of thinking that is a more human, humane, systemic way of looking at raw materials. She's done some really beautiful other textiles as well. And last, Suk Yoon from Korea, who worked with a lacquer called Ot, which is a natural lacquer used on wood and which he proposes to be used on ceramics so that it can be recycled, because ceramics typically are hard to recycle because of the usual glazes that are used. And there are many more, but those are the best of the best. Ah, yes, and this is a surprise. We were very lucky and very happy to be asked to um, restore the Savoy restaurant in Helsinki. Um, it was tired, and it had also had, you know, a fair number of barnacles added over the years, you know, project manager solutions to a problem. So the center was looking rather laden down with things that really weren't good enough. And, you know, it's what also often happens to cultural icons. It was unloved. You know, people think of it as a cultural thing, but then that's the reality. Dirty carpet, chairs that haven't been repaired and are on the point of collapse. The balcony that felt, to be honest, a bit like an old people's home. But they were amazing. You know, when you look into the papers, and we were very lucky to be able to look into the archives of the drawings, they were so passionate about the power of architecture and design. And I think the elephant in the room for interior design is, honestly, I know did the Savoy, not Alva. She signed the drawings, she did the drawings, she did the interiors, she designed the furniture. <laughs> and, you know, that has happened over and over again. They were a couple. I'm not saying it was her instead of them. They worked together for 25 years. They were at college together. He referred to her as the architect I know. Their friends said, Viola, a close friend, said he was the sparkle and the fireworks. She was more socially aware and deeper. That was what made them so incredible. And that's the reality, isn't it? One person can't do it alone. And I think we really need to start to look at buildings in that way. You know, Mies van der Rohe had Le Lily Reich. I mean, there are so many stories like that. And I think the trouble is, aside from credit, which is vital, it also discredits the role of interiors, because then nobody knows they exist. Their achievement was to make, and again to quote, to refine materials in a more humane direction. 
um, they were certainly not interested in what Alva called immature materials. He really felt it was all about what you did with materials. And there are many different woods, for example, in the Savoy. The details are beautiful. They were especially focused on the physical and psychological essence of comfort and talked about how it is from those little things that we should build a more harmonious world for people. So, my final slide is that those so-called soft values are what are crucial today. We still measure everything except for that that is worthwhile, to quote Kennedy. In the push for a more sustainable future, I think it's really important to remember that places that are loved are livable and they last. Thank you. Thank you.